All right, we are recording. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, okay, so welcome to retreat day two. Um, I think the agenda is pretty self-explanatory. I think our um, main goals here is to really talk about some ideas for projects, um, you know, maybe starting first with the newer members of the, of the group. Um, and then, um, and Jesse had suggested maybe five minutes per member with, you know, two and a half minutes or so of feedback. Um, then I think we want to try to maybe talk about based on those discussions, what is the best way to move forward with kind of the structure of our meetings? Do we continue to do as we've done or do we um, kind of develop a new approach based on the work we wanna do? Um, and then, and then, yeah, then we'll, then we'll close up. Um, Jesse had suggested an item here, working styles and expectations. So I was kind of hoping he would leave that discussion, but <laughs> he's not on yet. Um, so I'm not sure. So I might suggest actually we just, unless, does anybody have any thoughts on that topic? Anything they'd want to add? Not quite sure where to start with that. Um. Okay. <laughs> um, well, maybe what I suggest is that we'll go ahead and kick it into the project priorities. And if, as you're talking about your ideas, if you have anything you want to add specifically about how you like to work individually with the team, okay. um, you know, what you, what your expectations are for your project in terms of in the next six months, you'd be happy with your project if it was at this point, maybe that we can kind of work that into our project discussions. And if Jesse joins, um, we can touch back on that later. Does that sound good? Okay, great. Um, so with that, I don't know, um, Stella and Lori, you're both our newest members. I don't wanna put you on the spot, but um, I don't know if, if either of you wanted to, to go first. Lori, uh, Laura, I'm sorry, can I just um, interrupt oh, yeah. one second, just that um, process wise, I think we just want to point out that this is a retreat. So it's a different format than our regular meeting. And so there won't be public comment accepted during this uh, meeting today. And I think, well, I guess you have to decide if we're returning to regular meetings next week or not. So yeah, let's make sure we talk about that at the end. Yep. Um, because is this our regular meeting day, Seven, or is this our extra day? No, this is your extra day. Your regular meeting was the last retreat session that you did on the 4th. And then the 18th would be next week would be another back into your regular meeting schedule. But then okay. you have had three meetings in a row. OK, so we'll talk about that at the end. OK, thanks, Stephanie. Um, OK, uh, Lori or Stella, would either of you want to Stella, if you want to go first, I sort of would like, rather wait till Jesse gets here because I suspect what I'm going to say is probably something he's also interested in. I, I don't know. I'd... Okay. Yeah, I I wonder if what I, so one of, one of my th first thoughts, and this maybe is also relevant to Jesse's like working working styles and, and norms or whatever. Um, I, I wonder if it makes sense for us to go first or I wonder if it makes sense for us to go last because I wonder if it makes sense for like as newer members like I still don't fully understand the scope of what it would make sense to take on and if somebody it seems like it could make sense to like onboard by working with with somebody else who has a better sense of processes and yep. um, scope of work. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to throw out some ideas, but I also think it might make sense for us to actually go last instead of first. Okay. Um, does somebody want to go first? And what are we going for? What are we? <laughs> so this was what we discussed. So I think last week during our, during our retreat, 
we did some big picture framing and then we sort of got into a discussion on how do we prioritize and what's already in the cart versus what else we would want to do and um and so we ended that meeting with an agreement that we would each come to this meeting with a project idea or priority that we want to work on doesn't need mean to doesn't mean everybody and some people may not have one so i shouldn't assume that everybody's going to come with one um but because we 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 thought that what I was proposing was sort of rehashing what we already had in the cart, and instead of doing that, we would look at Vasu's list and like our own interest and sort of identify this is what I think to to meet the purpose of ECAP. I'm most interested in in working on, and this is how much time I personally, or maybe it's not even just what I'm interested in working on. This is what I think ECAP should work on. And this is how much time I personally would have to, to, to dedicate to that. So Steve, it could be for you that just what you're already working on, like it could be some, not something new. Yeah. Yes, I, I can, I can do that. Um, I was just looking for the uh, somewhere. I had the matrix from the jam board last year, uh, sorry, last meeting. Um, let me, okay. So I want to continue working on the initiative to help improve the energy efficiency of rental units in town. And this is something I've been working on with uh, Andra and I, and with help from RMI, which used to stand for Rocky Mountain Institute, now it's just RMI. And they have a coach that was helping us that had some organizational skill and there were some folks in RMI that had a great deal of skill. So our idea was to look at what some communities have done, which is electrification. And some communities are going about it to pass bylaws in their towns, re prohibiting new gas hookups. Um, and, and, uh, and new buildings and new construction and therefore requiring appliances and heating systems and cooling systems to be all electric. We decided not to go that route. That's having some problems because it conflicts with the statewide building code and towns and cities aren't allowed to do that. That may change in the future, but we decided to take an initiative to see if we could help uh, building owners improve the energy efficiency in a way that doesn't raise the costs for tenants and hopefully saves the tenants money. Because um, typically the tenants, we think, typically tenants are paying their own utility costs, the heat um, and uh, cooling costs. Uh, and yeah, heat and cooling costs, gas and electric. Um, and therefore if the building owners aren't paying those costs, they're not too incentivized to invest anything in the buildings to help the tenants save money. So that's sometimes referred to as a split incentive. The owner of the building doesn't have any incentive to improve its efficiency. So we spent some time, we had a citizens group. There was a couple of citizens that joined us and worked on this in several meetings. And we pretty much came down to what we'd like to do is encourage um, well, let's see, yes, to encourage building owners to improve the efficiency, we needed more data. We kind of knew what we have in town. Um, we recognized that the rental stock in town is quite varied from brand new to 150 year old properties, uh, from single family rentals to places that have over hundred apartments. And so to get a sense as to how we might proceed with the most effective um, kinds of approaches and strategies and to find the biggest bang for the buck, we started to try to figure out what the rental stock is in town. So that, that's an area that I've been focusing on. And Amherst has the rental uh, registration bylaw. And how much time do I have? Because I'm kind of rambling here. <laughs> um, so you've been talking for two and a half minutes. Oh, good. I'm halfway there. Good. Yeah. Um, so we have this rental um, rental registration bylaw that probably most of you know about, and that's been around for quite a few years, 10 years maybe. Um, and that requires places that rent out to register 
and to fill out a form that and certify that the place meets some um, public health and safety codes. There's a parking plan. And with the newer registration system, they also collect the number of um, bedrooms and bathrooms for each rental unit. Now there's only one permit is required per parcel. So a parcel might be a single family house. It might be a two family house, or it could be a hundred units like Puffton Village. Puffton Village actually, I think lies on four parcels. Maybe it's five and each parcel might have a hundred um, units. So it gets kind of complicated. So anyhow, I've been working with that data with the help of Stephanie and folks in the assess assessor's office to try to get a better understanding of the housing stock. And figure out what the, the range is. And then some folks from RMI are gonna be helping us with the data analysis. We are hoping to get some data that we get off the property cards, which the town assessor's office manages that would give us the age of the building and the construction type and the insulation and the heating fuel, which we don't otherwise have. That's turned out to be really hard to mesh these two data sets that live in different universes. Um, so that's been a challenge. So I'm continuing to work on that. The town council has begun to review the rental registration bylaw, and I need to get in touch with Mandy Joe because they are interested in having ECAC provide some feedback as they revamp this law, uh, this registration bylaw. I think they're aiming for pretty extensive revamping. We could provide some input. So I need to talk with Mandy Joe and then back to ECAC and say, what can we recommend? Um, besides getting a good assessment of the stock, what I'm going to suggest, and I'll, I'll make this more precise later, but is that we start collecting data from landlords, uh, building owners, and per, uh, on energy use, and that might be in the form of a building rating which doesn't actually tell us how much energy is used, but it rates the building in terms of its overall energy efficiency, I think on a score of like one to 100 or one to 10. Um, and that would be something that we'd have to talk about. It might be something that the building owners have to pay for. If it's a single family, they would pay for it for the single family. If it's a large rental complex, they typically study one or two units and then apply that score to all the other units that are the same. So we'd start collecting data on energy efficiency and then over time, we might consider asking building owners to increase the energy efficiency. So for those buildings that have the lowest scores, we could, the town could require them to increase the efficiency. And there are some communities that have done this. Sometimes there's caps on how much money the building owner has to spend per year on improving efficiency. We want to make sure that it doesn't cause tenants to be pushed out onto the street for any length of time while renovations are going on and it doesn't cause the rents to go up. So that in a long-winded nutshell is what I have been working on. Great. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. I question. just want to say thank you, Stella, for asking the old, the, the more experienced members to mm -hmm. go first because this is sort of what I was hoping would have happened last week where we find out what everybody's actually doing because I realize now that I mean what you just described Steve is what I was struggling to put together this week <laughs> how do we do this and you're already doing it which I didn't know I, I got bits and pieces of hints of it from the different you know meetings but I hadn't seen the whole picture until just now ah. and that's the main thing that I sort of want to be involved in I have some other little tidbits I can bring in but they're probably just tidbits compared to what you guys are but you and Andre have been doing so um, I, this is great. Let's keep hearing what everybody has been doing because I think that will really help uh, figure out where we fit in. Well, I any any other up. questions on what we've been doing? Well, Andre, me, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's keep going. Um, I'll, I'll follow up on, you know, what, what Steve described is um, our, efforts to influence the rental housing primarily that that's his you know that's the focus that the group um, that worked with RMI has has chosen um, but I am particularly interested in um, the single family homes um, and, and homeowners and how we um, prepare homeowners to 
be ready for the conversion of their homes, um, which is not a one-time thing. It's many different steps and it takes a lot of forethought. Um, and um, it's something uh, you know I've, I've worked on in, in other settings and you know, it's just sort of the, the, the thing I, I am most familiar with um, from my work on energy efficiency and being um, a bridge between customers and mass save. Um, so that that's another piece of the same, you know, building retrofit the existing buildings, you know, taking on our existing buildings piece. And, um, and then we talked last week also about the commercial property, which some of which is rentals, some of which is businesses. Um, and, and so, you know, there, there may be three different working groups for, for buildings. Um, so I, I could say more about what I imagine might, might be useful in the conversion um, discussions, but I have a feeling as we talk about what people's interests are that, that it'll come out. Um, Laurie. I just wanted to ask a question. When you say you were a bridge between mass saves and customers, what exactly does that mean? Um, well, I work for an organization called Energy Save, which is, um, you might've heard about the Gridspoon Foundation um, paid for a car equipped with infrared equipment to go around like all of these town streets um, in, I don't know, 10 different, 20 different towns and chose, you know, to work with 10 of them. And I, I was a part of that um, project in the early years. And so I was sort of the customer service person. So I heard the problems that people had in getting to, in working with massive contractors, um, and you know their hopes, their disappointments. Um, so, were you actually working for Mass Saves or for uh, independent uh, organization? That was just working for this independent organization as a sort yeah. of. Yeah, it was an independent organization trying to motivate people to use the Mass Save program. Cool. All right. Now this, this is great. I'm just trying to get a feel for how all of this works, yeah. what the possibilities are, and it's really nice to know things like that. Yeah. And, and Amherst was one of the um, communities that participated in that. Um, How long ago was that? Um, it started, um, da -da -da -da, what year is it? I think it started in 2017. And it sort of kept going for about three years in that form. Now, now the, the organization still is working on um, community-wide energizing around efficiency, um, but more through schools. So. so just to circle back really quickly to Steve, I think one question I have that I have for everybody is, what do you need, in, if anything, in the next six months to move this forward? Is it just time to do the work you're doing? Do you need support from someone on this committee or the council or Stephanie? And then like in the longer run, what do you envision needing? I think you kind of touched on that. Like we probably would need some kind of bylaw or something to do an energy scorecard or something. But I don't know if you have thoughts on either of those two questions. Yeah, that's good. Good question. That's a good thing to ask. Um, I think in the immediate future, it's time to connect with Mandy Joe, and to look at the data that we have uh, on the housing stock and come to some kind of conclusions. I'm hoping the town council will be kind of interested in that. And then maybe if there's more data that we want to get from the town, um, maybe the town council asks, they might get some more help. Mm -hmm. That would be the next thing. And then 
um, I'm not sure if, if Andra and I would want to try to continue working with Cora, who is our um, helper from RMI, or if we, I start working with one of you, uh, Lori, perhaps, and we come up with an outline of a plan, then we'll bring that back to ECAC for discussion and potential recommendations to town council. So those are the next steps, working on the data, coming up with an outline of a plan that how we might take advantage of the fact that the town council is revising the rental registration bylaw and what we might want to see in it. Can I ask a question? I'll, I'll do my thing later, but um, on that, which, which um, uh, you know, you, you have a great, great start on that and, and, and great work on that. I am wondering at what point it would make sense, unless you already have, uh, to you know, reach out to the property owner owner um, community, uh, of, of which you know there are probably some. I, I, I suspect there's some major ones, and there's lots of, of, of smaller ones, uh, but some maybe representation to to potentially um, you know even form form an advisory or, or a group um, to to. So it's not like a surprise that all of a sudden ECAC put something in front of the town council, but that there is some opportunity for them to actually. Um, uh, advise, maybe provide some of the data you're looking for, um, but also to, um, um, uh, you know, bring forward some of their uh, interests, uh, but also challenges that, that we can, uh, that you can bring back, that you can, you can cogitate about, but also bring back to us that we can help think through. Yeah, that's a great question. And I do look forward to that, to um, engaging with building owners, um, and managers. I'll have to see. I think if, if the town council is taking the lead on this and we are making some suggestions, then I suspect town council will bring in mm. the building owners to yeah. review and provide feedback on their ideas. Yeah. Um, if we were doing this ourselves outside of town council, then I think we would want to do that ourselves. But I will ask Mandy Joe what, uh, if they have plans for bringing in both renters and building owners as part of the review process. Yeah, you know, when the rental registration bylaw was created, the town manager created a team of it was 15 or 16 or 18 people that included building owners and some renters, um, quite a few staff people and a few others that um, kind of work together to come up with the best possible plan. So that they may be thinking of that already, but definitely want to get their feedback. Yeah, great. And it, but to your point, it doesn't make sense to um, have two committees if, if uh, or two 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 convenings of this the same right. group. Yeah, right. Great. Um. Okay. So, Andra, I don't know if that was your if you wanted to expand on that idea or if that was just kind of a response to Steve's idea. No, no. That this is the um the other piece of work that, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in moving into um, and uh, adding to our um, okay. building focus. Um, okay, great. So then I guess I would throw the same question to you that I threw to Steve. Like, if we wanted to move, what do you need to move forward over the next six months? It sounds like, um, and maybe you also could speak to some I mean, I think you gave us a great overview of the general idea, but are there like specific kind of steps that we need to take? Well, um, I think that uh, some of it is is similar to what um, both Jesse and Vasu have talked about in terms of educating and, and motivating. Um, and so um, that, that it might be a schedule of, um, events that are, are geared to homeowners who need to understand what's a heat pump, <laughs> um, why the three contractors in a row say I can't do it in my um, house and um, you know learn about battery storage, just sort of get the lay of the land. Um, it could also be work on um, uh, arranging, starting, um, 
piggybacking on um, energy um, efficiency coaches, um, that an idea that's taking shape in uh, other communities. And um, we could copy or, or um, maybe even use the, the services that are already being offered. Um, and I also think this may not seem directly related, but I think we have to tackle the contractor issue and, and talk with our local contractors about how they're gonna make the transition from whatever their business is now to um, exclusively providing services to electrify and co convert um, buildings uh, so that we can meet our climate goals. Um, you know, they're already starting. A lot of the oil distribution companies are already providing um, com their, their customers with heat pumps. Um, and yet clearly they're not fully informed. So um, I, I think there have to be some forums with them, for them, um, and, and really, you know, kind of mobilize them to be on board with our climate goals. So those are the three things that I, I think of um, yeah. primarily or first. Great. All right, any other questions for Andra? In terms of you know what would be needed, I think that this um, probably should be a sort of inside and outside um, working group, people who are interested in the community and um, maybe one or, or two others on ECAC. I, I would just offer that, that um, um, the challenges are, are, are high, um, but uh, in terms of um, materials, and, and, you, and I think the idea of sort of some events where there's opportunity for uh, people to come in and learn learn about electrification, um, and, and maybe it's even a bit of a fair where the contractors are there as well. But I'm thinking in terms of um, um, materials that would be helpful for people to have access to and even even take away, um, and um, I wouldn't to the to some extent we may need to um, um, make them sort of specific to to to, to Amherst, but there hopefully I I know Mass CC had materials out there on clean heat and so forth um, that are that we should make take advantage of. They may not be perfect. Um, they may be they continuously need to be updated, I guess, uh, but at least um, in terms of the heavy lift of materials that are approachable to, to uh, you know, homeowners uh, as sort of um, background materials and information materials, uh, we should probably um, take, you know, search around and find, find stuff that we can, um, that we would find helpful that we don't have to create ourselves. Yeah, Lori. Just to follow up on that, I did mention a few weeks ago, I think when Andra brought up uh, something about something similar uh, that I, I have used the Mass CEC or Mass Saves website. Uh, they have some great um, video webinars there and some of them they record. Now I was at a live webinar and I could not find a link to the recording of it. I think I told you I would get back to you, but I looked and couldn't find it. It was on different types of heat pumps mm -hmm. for the homeowner. And it was extremely informative. I watched it when I first got started trying to figure out how to convert my home. Um, they do provide this stuff, but it's hard to find it. On the other hand, they're very easy to get on the phone. And I haven't tried calling them to ask for those links, but I have a feeling they would provide them. So that might be something we could just talk to someone there about. Um, they do have a lot of things online already. Um, and I can probably find a page full of stuff, but it wasn't exactly what I promised I would send you. <laughs> Okay, great.
Somebody want to jump in next? Yeah, Dwayne. I'm happy to, to um, so, uh, talk about what I've been thinking about, which is more on the renewable energy development side, um, which is mainly solar um, for, for, for the town. Um, uh, as I'll, I'll be representing ECAC in the zoning bylaw uh, um, working group or, or uh, committee um, when that gets uh, fully formed. Uh, it's still, I think, work in progress. So we haven't, we haven't met at all uh, yet. Um, but um, between that and the solar consultant um, that Stephanie is hiring, um, what I'd like to focus on is, you know, this issue, which I think will take the year <laughs> to uh, to work through uh, with the town uh, and with the constituents in the town with regard to solar planning, solar visioning and thinking and planning for the town. Um, and uh, um, the, the solar <clears throat> aiming towards the solar bylaw uh, will be part of that. Uh, but also, I'm very keen on uh, working closely with the uh, as closely as Stephanie will will permit, I guess, um, with the with the uh, consultant uh, on the um, solar uh, solar assessment uh, uh, for the town, uh, and to some extent filling in some gaps that I think might or might not uh, be, be remain uh, with regard to that assessment. Um, and what I'd like to um, help lead, I guess, for, for ECAC is, um, I, I, and, 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 and Steve and I both did some analysis uh, probably a couple of years ago on sort of um, a rough estimate of, of what um, capacity of solar, megawatts of, of solar capacity it, it would take uh, for the town of Amherst um, with and without, but we're particularly looking without the universities. Um, uh, what it would take to produce, generate enough electricity for the needs of Amherst itself, the, the full town. Um, and, and I'd like to do a little bit deeper dive on, on that to, to uh, come out with some numbers that we can uh, present and, 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 uh, and defend, uh, as well as projections uh, that would look at um, where we may be at in, in, in 20, 30 years. Uh, with substantial electrification, um, and with those with those numbers and with this assessment uh, that this that the uh, solar comp, uh, solar um, consultants are are working uh, are going to be working on in parallel. Uh, what I'm keen on doing is is trying to use that assessment, use our um, evaluation of what Amherst needs to meet its own needs. Uh, to create a couple different scenarios of how the town um, might uh, site sufficient solar uh, within the town to meet uh, its needs under a couple different scenarios. One being meeting its current electric needs, second being meeting its needs in 30 years with electrification, uh, and then potentially a, a third scenario where we're not um, simply meeting our own needs, but we're really um, working more at a Commonwealth level and meeting, meeting, uh, providing a, a fair share of our um, of solar generation within our town for um, for the, the Commonwealth, uh, and that fair share may be based on land area, uh, but it could be based on on other things. So we can can toy around with some ideas there and, and come out with some scenarios, uh, and then using the mapping of where where siting might make sense. Um, and, and, and some, some good analysis of, you know, this is the amount of solar that would be um, technically or economically um, feasible uh, to site on rooftops, uh, on parking lot canopies, on, on, on the projects we already have in the landfill and the, um, and the, the Hickory Ridge and, and, and the, um, uh, or will have in Hickory Ridge and, and, um, and, and the other projects we already have in Amherst. Uh, here's some here's some scenarios of a combination of of sites, uh, rooftops, disturbed land, as well as the the potential need to to go into undisturbed lands um, that can um, satisfy these scenarios um, of um, of how, how much we do want to site uh, and generate ourselves in, in the town. 
Um, and, and to some extent also, I think it's important to bring in some, some cost into that as well. Um, I think we can get some information and, and maybe maybe add that to the scope of work of the, of the solar, um, solar, uh, solar consultants, but, it, but if, if not, then, then uh, I can work on this is, is sort of um, some sense, some reasonable sense at a high level of what, uh, what the differential costs are for putting it on a park, park, parking lot or, a, or a rooftop or, or open land or landfill. Um, and coming out in those scenarios, coming out with uh, sort of what the costs associated with that, uh, those different scenarios are as well. Not to, not at all to pinpoint specific parcels where we're going to put solar, because uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, but the types of of of, of siting, um, uh, again, uh, disturbed lands and and uh, 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 developed land as well as undeveloped land um, that could. Um, to, to get a reasonable, reasonably good um, vision uh, of what what we're really talking about in Amherst uh, with regard to um, uh, citing enough solar for our electric needs. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't, obviously there, there may be some other renewable energy development, uh, uh, but I don't see, I don't see, you know, uh, I don't, I don't see much else in terms of renewable energy sources that are applicable to the town. Um, I think part of this can also be looking at, I, not, not for the solar consultants, but it's something that um, I could add to um, is, um, you know, bringing in the, the, the concept of storage and how much storage might make sense um, at a high level again uh, for the town to marry with this uh, solar development. Um, um, so that's sort of what I had in mind um, working with on, on behalf of, of, of ECAC and sharing that all with everybody and getting input from everybody and anybody else who wants to join me in the, in the quest. Uh -huh. Great, thanks, Dwayne. That that's helpful. And what I sort of heard you say in terms of what's needed is, of course, you know, figuring out the scope of the consultant work is is going to be because then that will help you identify what gaps exist. Yeah. Um. And then what I think, um, uh, you know, I think the gaps are sort of what do we need to get a good. I'm just using your words back to you, but we need a good vision of what a meaningful, so meaningful solar strategy would look in Amherst and then how to, what information we need to have a meaningful and productive community discussion. Yes, yeah, 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 that's a good point. I, th I think the, um, this is sort of the, 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 the background work that needs to be done and then, and then um, engage, and this will probably also be part of the solar bylaw process, but you know, what is the community engagement with getting, um, uh, presenting the, these visions and scenarios and getting feedback uh, and input from, from um, a, a range of constituents? Yeah, so that's a, another place sort of where it's like figuring out what the scope of the working group is gonna do in terms of outreach and then seeing if there's gaps that ECAC might need to fill. Great, any questions for Dwayne? A lot of that was very, you know, it's a, a lot of technical. Um, and I, you know, besides Steve, I don't know that anyone else has that kind of um, background. What do you think you would need from an, another, you know, if, if an, another member wanted to join in? What, what role do you think needs to be played that would be helpful? Yep, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Um, well, if, if anybody has GIS skills, <laughs> again, we're talking pretty technical, I think, um, uh, and maybe some of you do, I don't know. Um, I do I do have a student that's going to be working with me on sort of a, another different project, but I think I can borrow some of his skills to, to, to help on this as well. But obviously most of this will, a good portion of this will be done by the consultant. Um, but um, to the extent that we might need to fill some gaps, um, some of that GIS work might be helpful. 
Uh, but more so, I, I think in terms of this group is, is feedback, I think on the scenarios that, that um, we lay out in terms of, uh, you know, what are, what are we, what do we want to present as ECAC, I mean, not just me as ECAC as, as um, you know, reasonable scenarios uh, and how do we describe those scenarios in, in words that, that make sense, um, uh, I, I think would be, would be good to, to uh, have input on. Um, particularly when we talk about maybe this fair share scenario. Um, and then also um, when we start marrying, you know, say we need, and I'm just making up a number, 40 megawatts of solar. And then we have this, this uh, resource assessment that says, you know, here's all the different siting options and so forth. How do we map 40, 40 megawatts onto, there's various, you know, there's a, innumerable ways to, to, to put 40 megawatts in Amherst, and the idea is to pick, um, is to do, to provide some scenarios of, of uh, um, examples of how 40 megawatts, say, could be sited in Amherst across the different um, types of siting, um, and that's somewhat subjective uh, and also requires a, a lot of defending, uh, and as well as um, uh, sort of visioning and 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 uh, uh, um, um, uh, more of a social process to to, to a large extent, uh, and so I think when we get to that point, uh, which I think we're we're not going to be there for a while, uh, because we need the the consultant mapping uh, mapping stuff and 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 some of this other technical stuff, as you say, Sandra. Uh, um, then um, then I could definitely want to um, uh, engage with with um, others that are really good at that stuff. For the record, I have a lot of GIS skills. Ah. <laughs> I would be happy to help with that. <laughs> I also have a license through UMass because I'm actually working on UMass GIS as for my PhD stipend. Oh, cool. OK. <laughs> OK, nice. Good to know, Stella. Thank you. I just uh, want to add, sorry, that, you know, the town does have a GIS department and typically oh, yeah. our consultants do work with the GIS team here in town yeah. um, if they need additional information. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there won't be a need or an opportunity for more expanded reconnaissance, if you will. I might add that um, one area that would be really helpful would be if more people, more of us knew more about the Massachusetts plan, the, the roadmap and the clean energy climate action plan, because um, that sets out a framework and there's a lot of technical analysis in there that spells out what the current needs are, what the needs will be as we phase out fossil fuels and replace that energy with electricity. And there's, it gets really detailed and you don't have to understand it all, but they've made all these models, these pathways of what, um, how much solar we're gonna need according to those models. And I think we need to help our community understand that in a you know, relatively non-technical way without getting into the nitty gritty details, but help them understand the framework of what is required to replace fossil fuels. And so if some of you wanted to study that, we could have some study group sessions. I've, I've looked at it. Um, and then you might take on the goal of trying to organize some education for the community, for the town um, citizens about this is what it will take according to the Massachusetts plan to replace fossil fuels. Because um, I think that that baseline, that that model is, is really what we we need to understand because um, it's, it's huge. It's vast. Yeah, the, the scale, the scale yeah. is, is way beyond um, what what I think people are, are thinking right. <laughs> at this point. Yeah. I think I think you're really spot on with that and how you how you uh, you know, maybe understand that at the Commonwealth level, and then and then uh, uh, apply it to to Amherst um, uh, uh, is really is really important. And I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. If, I mean, one of the takeaways from that roadmap uh, that I I just had students look at it and, and teach me because <laughs> they did deeper dives into each of the each of the um, subgroup uh, uh, detailed reports. Mm. Um, and one takeaway was that the Commonwealth is expecting a more than doubling of our electricity needs yeah. by 2050. 
um, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, substantially above a doubling, uh, not a, not at all a tripling, but about a, a 1.2 or 1. Point, uh, uh, times. Uh, and so, um, um, and, and the scale they're talking about, even, even the offshore wind, offshore wind's a big component, uh, putting a lot of eggs in that basket, as I think they should. Uh, but you know we're we're so excited about these first couple projects. But by 2050, those those are those are going. We need we need so much more uh, by 2050. Uh, and then the hydro from Quebec uh, is, is uh, precarious at this point. And if that doesn't come in, if that doesn't come in, then the amount of solar we need uh, is expected to go up quite a bit. Um, oh, and 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 nuclear would be on the table to some extent. Yeah. Um, but oh, go ahead, Lori. A quick question. You're talking about the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization roadmap. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would be interested in digging into that. The, the decarbonization roadmap provides a bunch of different scenarios, and then they model all the different components of different kinds of energy and transmission lines and whatnot. And then that's going to be uh, legislated in the Clean Energy Climate Plan, the CECP, which is being worked on as a draft, and that is supposed to be finalized as a legislate made into law. Um, I think it's July one. Is that right, Andra? Um, so the CECP Clean Energy Climate Plan is a is guided by the roadmap, um, but the CECP will be law. It'll it'll be what the legislature does to move towards that those goals. Some, there's some deadline in July. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a legislative or it's an act by EEA. The 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 the, uh, the secretary that has to put something in place by 20 by July. Okay. Um, uh, to to uh, um, yeah, I think it's a, to basically have a roadmap that's fairly uh, detailed to get to the intermediate targets of 20, 25 and twenty thirty. I think it is. Right. That's right. Yeah. The CECP focuses on those yeah. next. Um, Marks. Yeah. So sort of inspired, Andra, by your comment earlier about sort of tackling the contractor issue and whether we can have a forum with that. I think that's a really smart way to have a more scalable impact because we're not trying to reach each individual homeowner. We're trying to reach a group of people that whose job is it to interact with homeowners. Um, made me think Steve, when you were just talking that maybe educating the community could start with educating our climate activists groups in the community. Um, and if we could maybe set up a forum with them to talk about, because I think one of the challenges we have, the headwinds we have with this is that I think some of our local well-respected climate activists are not coming out strong on this issue or coming out on the other side of the issue in terms of focusing on forestation, which is also a very important part of climate, but as Steve showed in his data, you know, we, we need, we really are gonna need to focus on both things um, and a ton of solar. So um, I don't know, I think that's, that's just something that came to my mind when I was, when I was listening to you, you both talk. Well, one possibility is that I, I did that presentation for you guys back in November, and if that's something we could, as a group, or maybe a small group of us, maybe we revise that, and some of us present it to, in some public sessions, it's kind of a high-level overview of the roadmap and, and the 2030 goals. Um, and probably some of you are sort of better at de technological, <laughs> getting some <laughs> of the technical jargon out of there that is uh, second nature to me, but you might be able to say, oh, wait a minute, make it simpler. Um, so I'd be happy to work on that. Um, for those of you that didn't see it, um, there it is recorded and um, somewhere I have a link, Stephanie can provide the link if you want to sit down and watch that, what was it, like a half an hour long presentation. Um, and then we could talk about whether we want to sort of take that on the road out to the public or invite specific groups, like you're saying, some of the activist groups um, and, and start maybe start small, but start that 
as an education program. I know Vasu was sort of interested in that. Uh, that um, could yep, be a starting point. Send that link. That would be great. Okay. Do you have that easily, Stephanie? Can you find that or? Uh... Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, okay. Anyone else want to jump in? I have one other thing that I'm particularly interested in, and um, it would involve um, asking the council to do a resolution. Um, I don't think it needs to go much farther than that. Um, we're in a really enviable place in some ways in Amherst and a couple other communities around here because we have the gas moratorium that the gas companies have imposed on us. Um, yet we have no reason to think that they don't want to lift it if they could um, and that they're not having backroom conversations with people in town about that. And so I would really like to see Amherst come out and say, don't lift, keep it. We don't want more gas, we're going off gas. So that um, is particularly important given um, the plan. You might remember that we submitted a, um, a letter to, for the process that the gas companies were going through in planning their um, own decarbonization. Um, and one of the key points that they are, are putting forward that is an industry-wide ploy is to introduce um, regulations that would allow them to um, substitute some natural gas with hydrogen or renewable natural gas, which um, have a number of different problems. Renewable natural gas is still methane, it still leaks, it still uh, causes global warming. And um, hydrogen has a whole set of other problems, good for some uses, not being produced green in at scale yet and will be a while before there's that kind of excess green energy in order to produce hydrogen for those heavy industry and perhaps you know jet fuel that needs that it will you know that that's where it'll be used so um we're we're on you know like facing the the gas companies plans possibly being approved, just rubber stamped by DPU. The legislature is making moves to um, interfere with that um, possibility, but I'd love for Amherst to make a statement that um, we, we just aren't gonna continue to put gas in. And, um, and that goes for propane too because that's what some of our new buildings have done so rather than, you know, in, in the hope that we might get um, natural gas, new hookups back again, um, they put in propane. So new buildings, low hanging fruit, let's just say no. So that's, that's a, a little project. <laughs> Yeah, Lori. Andra, are there particular state laws that you know about that are already being considered that we should be aware of? <laughs> Sopic? There's particular um, proposed regulations and um, counter proposed regulations that are being considered right now. 
If you can send out a um, link to those or an email about them, I would appreciate it because I like to write letters about things like that or make phone calls. All right, yeah. Great. Um, anyone else wanna jump in? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think community outreach and education is an untapped area. So, you know, I'd love to partner with Andra. I know she brought it up. Um, I think we have disparate systems and everyone's doing their own thing, you know, talking to some of the other um, <coughs> organizations that are supporting this, I, I think will be beneficial. Um, I'm also uh, one of the committee members for, of uh, UMass Pioneer Valley network and we were talking about sustainability and we're going to do an event in the Hitchcock Center. So I, I think there might be an opportunity to work with the town, the bid, um, and then the Pioneer Valley Network as well and see how we can increase awareness. What is that, Basu? What's the network? Oh, it's UMass Pioneer Valley Network. Uh, it's an alumni network. Sorry, I didn't hear that. A what network? It's UMass Pioneer Valley Network, alumni network. Alumni, okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we, we base we we plan events and usually it's around wine and cheese. But <laughs> this year we were talking about sustainability and um, do something give something back to the community. Great. Yeah, it sounds like there has been quite a few ideas around outreach and education that have been thrown out already that I think um, we could run with to kind of pull the different projects together. Um, Don, Stella, Lori. Sure. Yeah, I I see the in like this is spreadsheet the transition to zero emission vehicles and road stuff as a big piece that's adjacent to what a lot of people are taking up, but also not, um, doesn't seem to have a dedicated person on it right now, correct me if I'm wrong. But I could see potentially working with Steve because it seems like the offering zoning and permitting incentives to developers to include charging stations, for example, um, that could go along with a, a rental unit situation. It also, it also gets into kind of a, <laughs> personal situation where I keep getting yelled at or almost killed on a bike in town because like biking is so scary. And like, I guarantee you so many more people would be biking if it were like less scary, which is a little bit adjacent to the transitioning to like zero emission vehicles. Um, but I think if we're talking about road infrastructure, we're talking about road infrastructure to a degree. And maybe, I mean, that also gets to education and like changing norms but it also gets to like under the equity piece in the spreadsheet involving student groups, because I know a lot of students complain about the, the biking and pedestrian danger <laughs> situation. Uh, so yeah, and I, I also would be a kind of under that interested in hearing what would be needed and wanted for the, the five-year plan for the municipal fleet policy and changing that over over to electric um, and taking that on. And that also to me seems like it would also get into kind of talking to contractors because again, I'm like a, I'm a CDL driver and I kind of have a sense of trucks and uh, would be willing and open to, to chat with maybe contractors on, on that front. Um, I have a sort of personal opinion based on my own work that a lot of people are driving bigger trucks than they need to be in addition to driving uh, gas trucks when they might not be needing to be. Yeah, there was just a study that came out yesterday or the day before that like 80% of medium sized trucks and 60% or 60 and 40%, some percentage of medium and large trucks don't travel far enough that they would need that they need gas like no 
on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which is like a, one of the, um, I feel like, uh, myths about the challenge of decarbonizing the transit industry is that they travel these long distances all the time and therefore they need, they can't possibly run on electricity, right? Well, or like idling, because I, I feel like I have a little bit of insight into idling, which really the issue with idling is a public space issue, because which is then kind of a town issue, because you can't like eat lunch outside when it's below freezing, you know, so you sit in your mm -hmm. truck with the truck on. And like, I've done this, like not proud of it, but there's no alternative. If it's not acceptable from these companies to have people seeking out some type of like indoor space for breaks. And if there's no indoor public space available, I mean, especially in a pandemic, the pandemic has a whole nother level to this. Um, but yeah, so I would definitely be interested in taking up perhaps in, in collaboration with, with Steve or, or Vasu or, or Andre and wherever it seems to kind of make sense, um, some of the vehicle, vehicle and roadway stuff. Stella, I just wanted to say I agree with you wholeheartedly on the bicycle issue. This is a pet peeve of mine. My my bicycle, every time they repave uh, Pelham Road, it gets less and less usable by bicycles because the, the edge of the road gets worse and worse. They pave the middle, but not the edges. And uh, I mean, my, personal, my personal safety device is a giant pool noodle, which I use crosswise across my bike to keep the cars away from me. And I have an extra one if you'd like to use one. <laughs> totally, I was doing tree inventory at UMass and just biking back and somebody was like yelled out the window, like sidewalk. It's like, fuck, you know? Or like the, yesterday I was trying to cross the crosswalk downtown, like with my two-year-old and a, a driving instructor from the driving school didn't stop at the crosswalk. <laughs> I mean, the norms are just not there. <laughs> Stella, I just want to say I'm so impressed with all of your hidden talents that are coming out today. <laughs> Great. Don, did you want to throw anything out? S sorry, before you go oh, down, yeah. real quick on what go Stella ahead. had to say. I, you know, I, I'm also interested in the transportation sector. I, I know I mentioned uh, outreach and community, but that's another area of my interest as well. So okay. willing to work with Stella on that. And I guess with respect to the follow-up question you've been asking, Laura, again, because I'm so new, what I would like appreciate from people is kind of where where to focus and who who to, who to work with. Um, again, I would also be happy to work on, on GIS stuff. If that's one, one particular thing about transportation is that there is a transportation um, committee that um, has expertise and probably has discussed bike lanes a lot. So um, you know, the whole street concept has definitely been thrown around in, in that committee. So what I'm hearing there is maybe, would it maybe be useful to this committee if I talk to them to figure out what parts of the CARP they're taking up and what parts they prefer stayed in ECAC? Yeah. I think like, would that maybe be a helpful first thing to do? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, we haven't even met with them to um, present the CARP to them. So that could be a first step. Um, yeah, it's Wayne, unless you did. <laughs> Who meet? No. Yeah. No. Okay. No. I, I, I finish your thought, and then I okay. had to dumb it down. I thought you were jumping in to be like, I did that already. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I completely forgot. Um. So, so yeah, I think, and we talked in the past about maybe having some type of liaison to TAC. I know when Darcy was on the committee, she was a TAC liaison, so that did a little bit of that. But maybe, um, it would be worth starting out with just like asking to get on their agenda to present some of the CARP elements and have a conversation and then seeing where it goes from there. I was just going to add that I see linkages here between um, what um, uh, probably even even Steve on the on the sort of the rental units, but also Andra on the homeowner. You know, I think if we if we do have and 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 Basu on sort of the, the educational uh, ven venues, 
so if we do have the opportunity to, um, you know, have an educational program, say to homeowners about electrifying their, their homes, it would be, it seems like it would be a great opportunity to not, to, to maybe focus on heat pumps, uh, but also um, bring forward um, the opportunities for um, an electric vehicle. Uh, and for that matter, solar on their roof, it's, if it's appropriate for their roof. Uh, and sort of tie these all together. If we got, you know, homeowners coming to an event um, uh, and we don't have too many wax at, uh, bites at the apple, um, might as well talk to them about sort of the full decarbonization opportunities in front of them. I, I think leading with the, with the, um, the heating of their homes, because that's the big one, uh, but then also um, uh, their, their transportation um, primarily with electric vehicles, but also with with um, public transportation, bicycles, uh, and then solar on their roof if it's if it's uh, if it's something. So, um, just th th that thought came up to me, um, came into my head as as uh, um, the transportation topic was going on. Okay, great. No. Anything else for Stella? Sorry, Stella, I sort of jumped ahead there. I saw Don took his mute off and I forgot to ask you the follow-up question. So thanks for doing my job for me. Oh yeah, no. I'm also like <laughs> super interested in everything having to do with Hickory Ridge and plans for Hickory Ridge. <laughs> yeah. Now, right. now, yeah, go for it. now, now. Um, I, actually, I did want to um, throw in a little bit um, in response to what you said, Stella, having somebody who used to bike a lot and in fact rode my bicycle across the country when I turned 50, um, I think we could use some education for bicyclists too. Um, not just, I've seen so many bicyclists be pedestrians when they wanted to be pedestrians and, and bicyclists and on the road when they wanted to be on the road. Um, I share how how scary it can be, you know, riding a bicycle with a lot of traffic, and I, th I think there needs to be just kind of general education um, all the way around with res with respect to that. Um, I, I know I, as a driver, even though I was a even though I did a lot of bicycling at, at one time, can find myself getting upset sometimes at, 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 at bicyclists and, and, and how they behave. Not serious ones, but you know, there, are, there, there are, and I like to see the town you know, kind of emphasizing bicycles. And, and I love to see the new stands that come up and the, and, the, and, and the availability of being able to take a bicycle and, and ride it and bring it to the next place. So, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm I'm serious about bicycling, um, but in response to I, I for myself, I'd be interested in in following up on what we talked about last week on that on the pace program, and 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 that would dovetail into what you were talking about, Steve. Since I think we will find a lot. Uh, I mean, there are not that many flat commercial buildings. In, in Amherst. There are a lot more um, buildings that are rental units that would fall within um, the rubric of what that program will be like. So it would be a really nice dovetail um, of those two things. And I'm happy to work with anybody who wants to, to work on that. Um, I also think I just I just because I'm new at this, Andra. I, I have a question on um, on the issue of uh, uh, right now, uh, you know, causing new construction to be. Um, is is there a big cost differential um, right now, given given what's going on right now to you know to energize to to provide energy to a building, you know, heat and otherwise using electricity as opposed to propane, for example. I don't know the numbers compared to propane. I, I've been wanting to look at that. Propane is crazy expensive. Well, but, it, it was this year. It, it was absolutely crazy expensive. This yeah. Year. 
so um but the the um studies of you know hooked up gas versus electrifying from the start it's it's um pretty much equivalent at this point so there's no there's no real kind of cost issue in, in, in with respect to, to that particular pro program. That's good to know. Which well, it's higher upfront cost. You mean to yeah upfront. so I think that there was a there was a forum or whatever on the hill recently where a lot of experts um testified that they're seeing construction costs of a new build that's all electric versus a new build that's fossil based as being 1% increase. So pretty much at the margins at this point, right? Um, five or 10 years ago, five or eight years ago, that was like 8% to 10%. So it's going in the right direction. Good. Yeah, I was um, expressing more for existing buildings. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so for existing buildings, I think that's something we could, uh, that may be an interesting discussion to have with the commercial he heating company forum. I mean, because of the current, I can only speak to my personal experience, but because of the current mass save rebates, it was cheaper for me to get heat pumps than to replace my oil furnace. This year in January, it wasn't cheaper in December. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm all for education though, like you, Lori. Edie, my wife and I are looking into how do we get rid of our propane, um, you know, with our existing system, which is a which is a hot water system with baseboard hot water, um, and my head spins as I as I try to figure out the, the various possibilities. Um, uh, yeah, so. It's, yeah, that's why I've got a note here about somebody coming to look at geothermal at our house. Uh, in, uh, uh, I was, I was hoping you might bring that one in because um, I, I wanted to also invite everybody to the local energy advocates um, session next Tuesday at, at seven. We're going to have Ben Weil um, from UMass, um, Dwayne's colleague. Um, talk about geothermal ground source heat and just how it works and what are the economics of it and kind of 101. So I'll, I'll send that to, oh, oh no, we, we did. I sent, I sent the link earlier. So yeah. everyone has the link. And when I was looking, there's a, there's a 26% federal tax credit on geothermal this year. Yeah, the problem is you have to have. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's a lot of upfront costs. Yeah, well, twenty thousand. You know, down yeah. for fifty thousand. But yeah. yeah, no, right. But it's still yeah. Right, so, you're right. You you need to have the tax liability to have a tax credit. That's true. Well, you also need to have a property that they can get a giant rig on to dig a well. That's true too. <laughs> um. Okay, so this has been this has been great. Uh, is anybody not gone? I think everybody's gone. Oh, Laura, you haven't gone. Okay, sorry. I thought you had chimed in, but go for it. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah, I chimed in, but I I, I did have uh, a couple of thoughts I wanted to throw out there. So I am, I think, most interested in working with Steve. Um, you know, if, if there's room there. Uh, on converting rental buildings and also doing outreach to talk both to the renters and the and the rentees, um, who I think we need to you know do that in parallel somehow. Um, I noticed that in thinking about this this week, I noticed a couple of interesting things. One is that there's quite a lot of information out there from people who have already written down how you do this, and um, not only Rocky Mountain, but there's also uh, things like uh, let's see. Um, there's this uh, ACEEE, -E -E, I forget what that stands for. Um, in New York, I think it's located in New York. They have a guide for improving rental housing efficiency, which goes through all these steps of doing the outreach and getting the database of where the renters are. 
And so database is also something I have a lot of experience with some programming. I don't have GIS skills specifically, but um, I have played with databases and I, I'm pretty good at programming in different languages. And uh, I, like a physicist, I know enough about it to be dangerous. I can do it. <laughs> I'm certainly not a programmer, but I do a lot of analysis and database work using, using either MATLAB or Python or different tools that are out there, Tableau. Um, I can probably pick up anything I need to if there's a particular language that people are speaking. So if there's a way, I heard you mention something about databases that need to be merged for rental units, where the, where the information is about how they're heated versus where the information is about you know, everything else. Um, that's the sort of thing I've done before and could conceivably do again. Um, and if there are specific outreach, you know, if, there, if there's specific things that need work, I mean, this is something I suppose we should, we should talk about. Um, I don't know how much of this we can do offline when we're doing work, but if we're two of us are working together on a project, um, you know, maybe there's some room for us to be able to talk about that, um, how to go about that, uh, so we don't have to do it here in the in the main meeting. Um, uh, I don't know if there's room for that or not, but at any rate, we can talk about that too. Um, the other thing I noticed is that uh, there's a conference coming up on this topic. <laughs> Being an academic, of course, I put in a Google search for all these different things. And there is a, I don't know if this is interesting to anybody or not, uh, but where is it? I wrote it down. It's coming from DOE is holding a conference on, um, let's see. There's also a California plan on how to do this um, that spells all of this out. Here it is, Energy Center buildingbettersolutioncenter.energy.gov slash summit. Does anyone know about this? This is happening next week in DC. And there's actually a, uh, they're encouraging people who are working with local governments. That's one of the set of sessions is aimed at local governments. Um, so I can I can send that, that to everyone if anyone's interested, if you happen to be in DC next week. It does cost to attend and it's live only and not via Zoom or I would have signed up regardless of the cost, but um, it's not that expensive on the scale of, of, uh, of summits like this. Anyway, I don't know if that's interesting or not, but uh, there's a lot out there that people have already written on this and it might be worthwhile going through one or two of those documents. Uh, it deals with all of the different things we've been talking about from gathering the information to, to outreach. Uh, and Andra, uh, yeah, this is also, you know, it, 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 to the extent that there's outreach and uh, uh, to do and, and um, you know, specific, specific information that we can transmit, that we can learn so we can transmit it so that we can talk to people. Um, I'm really happy to, to do all of that, to do outreach or to do data stuff. Stephanie, okay, one great. of the th things that I did not mention was the outreach that we have started, which is to connect with renters. Stephanie, can you do an off-the-cuff summary of the, uh, is it the Empower grant? And yeah, which we're not be? supposed to name yet still. I don't know why. Oh, oh we're they, still. I know. I, yeah, I, we're still under embargo for that for some reason. But anyway, it's through MassCEC. We have a grant to work with um, a community partner, Family Outreach of Amherst, and we're creating a survey for the rental community that family outreach is mainly going to be doing the um, development and, and distribution of the survey to the rental community, um, mostly people that they already work with. And they have some folks identified as um, outreach captains, if you will, which is sort of similar to what Andrew was talking about. So there will be people identified for complexes. And there's one person, originally we were gonna secure an intern, but we're gonna have one community member who's actually gonna organize all of the captains and kind of lead that effort. And they're gonna be putting together the survey, gathering information, um, and then we'll compile that information and submit it to the town. And basically the town will have to sort of put together a report on the, um, on the effort and that, um, the questions are geared towards renters um, and specifically about, you know, um, questions related to building efficiency, you know, comfort level, um, you know, things they need or want or, um, you know, might also include questions about whether they um, pay their utilities or not, those kinds of things. So um, we're really slow. This is probably the slowest effort I've ever been involved in in terms of getting it launched because, 
we're having real questions about the contract just in terms of the fact of um, it used to be that you could just sort of pay people stipends and you know it was kind of an easy process but we're having all of you know there are now these sort of audits that have been happening so that when you hire these people they're employees and no one wants no one like the town and the agency neither want to sort of be in that role of having to be the administrators but we've kind of worked it out so I think we're going to be paying um family outreach to administer the, that program. So they'll technically be the administrators, but you know, there's gonna be translated materials and translation that's gonna be part of that. And um, so that we can really reach a broad um, swath of the community with this outreach effort. Sorry, I had to throw baseball pants down the stairs. Um, okay, <laughs> so so great. So I've taken some notes here, and I, I think I have a pretty like good vision of of some ideas to, to move us forward. I, I can maybe, and we're sort of right on time here. So maybe I'll go ahead and go and give my project idea spiel, and then we can go into. The summary of what we talked about and how we might want to organize our meetings moving forward to best facilitate progress. Um, so something that I, I'm kind of a big picture strategy thinker person. So something that I keep coming back to is, you know, what's the what's the goal of ECAC and and are we best equipped to meet meet that goal? Um, and you know, as I talked about last time from our charge, you know, our purpose is really to guide the town in meeting climate mitigation and resiliency goals. And I was thinking, reflecting a little bit on what I do in my day job, which is, you know, trying, you know, pushing companies to do more on climate action. And it used to be that setting goals was what we focused on, getting companies to set goals. And now it's, you know, goals aren't enough anymore. Goals are foundational, but you know, we don't have enough time to only be setting goals. What's the actual plan? How are you meeting your goal? Um, and in some ways we've done both of those things, right? We've set our goal, we have a decarbonization strategy, um, but when we talk to companies about it, we, we talk about, you know, not only just your decarbonization strategy, but what is your, you know, how are you leveraging what is your governance? What is your business strategy? How do you make sure that if your CEO leaves tomorrow, your climate goals and all the work you're doing around climate is actually still gonna go forward? Um, you know, how is that built into your board governance? How are you, um, you know, adjusting your business strategy, like your funding models, how, you know, fundamentally changing how your business operates in the future because we're looking at a fundamentally different future. Um, how are you thinking about the just and inclusive pieces of your transition and making sure that you're not coming up with decarbonization strategies that just continue to um, rely on the same systems that have created all the inequality that we already have. So, um, and then how are you engaging on policy? How are you being active in policy? Because if you're not actually going out and shouting to the rooftops what policies you need to meet your goals, you're not gonna meet them no matter how great your internal strategies are. So that's what we've been telling companies to do. So I thought, okay, well, how would I apply that back to, to Amherst and where we are? And I think we've got solid goals. We've got a solid sort of decarbonization plan and maybe where we could use a little bit more support or maybe where we haven't thought as much about is sort of, on the governance side of things, on the benchmarking side of things, being able to prove ourselves, which we know I know came up quite a bit last week. Um, and then on sort of the policy lever pieces. So when I thought through how that would look for, for ECAC and for the town, a couple of like specific ideas that came to mind would be, you know, having clearer processes for which ECAC gets involved in certain things. Like I would love to see that there's a clear process in place where at some point during the budgeting process, ECAC gets a chance to look at the budget 
and confirm that it is aligned with meeting our goals, or at least it's not supporting funding things that are going against our goals of, or against our climate goals. So I would love to figure out a way to like build that into the system, recognizing of course that Stephanie already and her, her colleagues already are building climate into the lens that they're applying to their department budgets. And if that all works as planned, our review would just sort of be superficial because hopefully at that point it would be, yes, everything's going well. But I think even just having that process in place sort of provides more, or it just sort of helps to solidify that this is something Amherst cares about. We care that our budget is aligned with our, our climate goals. Um, I think another, another idea is establishing a clear process by which if the councils is proposing or reviewing policy related to climate, then ECAC also gets to review it in some way and it's built into the process. And we're sort of seeing that happen already. Um, you know, this happening with the solar, solar work, it's happening with the rental agreement work. Um, and I wonder if there's not a, formal, a more formalized process we would put into place there to make sure that that continu it continues in that light. And maybe that's the role of Anna as our liaison to bring that to us as well. So there could be different ways to approach that. And then I also thought it might be helpful to have, and this gets to the policy, another angle of the policy piece, which is like, is there a way that ECAC or the town or the council or all three of us have a regular meeting with our state officials to really discuss what state level levers we need to help us meet our goals. And then maybe in, in like the three ideas I have, one of them it, we talked about already, which of course is state level support for building electrification, electrification. We need new laws to be able to pass our own laws around electrification. But the other two places is state level support for benchmarking and inventories. Like I can only imagine how inefficient it is that each community is left with trying to figure out its own carbon footprint and with very little data or consistency in the data, without enough staff support to actually do it, like, is there a way the state could come in and just help us? We all need to be collect. We all need to be collecting that data. They need to know it to to show their results. So I just wonder if there's something that they couldn't do there. Um, I also think state level support for alternative funding mechanisms is is key. Like maybe you know, maybe it's giving money directly to the town to support the things that the community actually needs to address climate. Maybe it's helping us understand how moving from owned fleets to leased fleets or moving from, you know, moving towards a green bond scenario or moving to, or figuring out a way to, um, or at the state level, you know, updating the funding mechanisms they have for the libraries and the schools and everything else so that it's not, penalizing folks that want to do climate um, forward development. So those are kind of my, my ideas, how I'd actually do it. I mean, maybe it's for option one about the budget or idea one around just having ECAC have a review of the budget. You know, that might just be, I guess, meeting with Lynn and Anna to discuss if that's a possibility to build into the, the, the calendar. Um, and then on the state level, I mean, maybe there's already ways that Stephanie, you guys engage with the state officials. I know the, or, but that would be something to look into. It's like, what are the, what are the mechanisms by which the town council and the town already communicates with Mindy and Joe and whether or not there's a way to um, feed into that process to bring like a climate specific discussion to that. All right, any questions for me? <laughs> that all seems really smart and well thought through. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, what do you see as, um, you know, is it an ongoing working group or is it um, project by project sort of? You mean with like the state reps? 
Well, you mentioned a lot of different aspects of it. Um, so is, is the need for there to be, you know, two people on the committee who are thinking about that in an ongoing way together? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you know, we have, we have a li council liaison and I know that we've um, gone to council meetings in the past when it's been a topic of interest to us, but I don't think anyone on this committee, unless I'm misspeaking, follows the council work closely enough to, to know when something's coming up that may or may not have a climate impact. So, so maybe it's worth talk. And so, but I don't think we should, I don't necessarily think unless somebody really wants to do that, that's the, the best way to do it. Maybe it's, there's somebody on this committee whose job is it, it is to connect with Anna every two weeks or something and just get a sense of what's going on and if there's something that we should be aware of. Um, in terms of the bud, in terms of the budget process, um, maybe that need, maybe there needs to be a, I think it needs to start with a discussion with Lynn, maybe Andy, who I think is the, the chair of that committee um, and just see what, what we could potentially do there um and maybe it's we need a liaison i mean we've talked in the past about having certain members of our group be liaisons in key places um or and so but the problem is that that stretches us thin but maybe the finance committee is one place where we do need to be engaged a little bit more so in terms of specific next steps it would be talking to Lynn and Anna and potentially Andy about the budget review idea um, and and potentially sort of the, the council, you know, and sh making sure that everyone on the council is aware that I think some council members think that there is a rule in place that like anything that goes through the council that's climate related comes to ECAC, but that's not the case. So. Um, you know, talking about those two issues with um, Anna and Lynn to start and bringing that back to you all about that conversation. And then, um, yeah, I guess maybe Stephanie, I don't know if you have any insights on like state rep engagement or, um, or that would be another question for that group. So maybe the very first step is to meet with Anna and Lynn and just explain these three, th three things and see what their thoughts are. Yes, I respond to a few of these things. So again, sort of structurally how this is set up and I need to sort of remind you all that you are a town manager appointed committee. You are not a committee of the council. So you really need to be engaging Paul Bockelman more and you need to be going through him more. And if you wanna have these conversations, then you know, I mean, I think it's fine to try to schedule a meeting with um, Lynn. I think it's even honestly uh, might even be a little bit problematic to be, even though Anna is the liaison to this committee, she's a li liaison and technically her role is to just listen and report back. That's officially what the liaisons are supposed to be doing, not engaging quite so much. Um, it's supposed to be reporting back to the council. And so communication does need to go through the town manager and you need to sort of include him more. And I'm, you know, I know that's not, you know, it doesn't make it easier. I just, but that is really the pathway, you know, that we need to be um, following. So we do need to include Paul in those conversations. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing I wanted to bring up that sort of came about in my mind as you were all talking is I want to also remind you that you don't want to make your project work kind of official subcommittees you want to keep it to you're kind of working on some stuff on the sidelines that you're going to bring back maybe one person brings back to the committee and like maybe one person is kind of the point person for the for the work and the other person is kind of helping if you will because once you're 
once you sort of assign people to go off and work as a pair on these projects, you become a subcommittee and then the meetings need to be posted. So I'm just here to keep you all above board and to make sure that we don't get in violation of open meeting law, because it does happen and people do call the town out if it's something that somebody has an issue with that you're working on and they don't like, they will call you out on open meeting law violations. So I really wanna make sure that we're clear about, about all that. So that's all I'm, and as far as the insights about meeting with our state reps, I, you know, there's no clear process. I think that's a matter of, um, I think this is a great, I love the idea and I think it's a great idea to propose to Paul. It's more appropriate to propose it to Paul than to propose it to Lynn. Okay, so then I think we would need to meet with Paul. Okay, so we tried to do that earlier this year and we never did it. So is there a special sauce to doing that meeting, Stephanie? No, just, you know, just you can reach out and let him know uh, that you'd like to schedule a meeting with him that you have some ECAC business that you wanna, and ideas and some regular meetings and I, you know, that you'd like to share with him and that you'd like to set up. Okay, that sounds good. Um, okay, so then in terms of sort of what I've, I've tried to bucket some of the ideas we've talked about into kind of three different, three different buckets here. Um, so sort of short term. And so there's there's a one bucket that's related to like education and outreach, short term and longer term. And then there's a bucket related for, to ongoing research projects with the potential for future outreach. So in terms of the short term outreach, meeting with Paul, meeting with TAC. So, so I can spearhead meeting with Paul. Stella, if you maybe wanna spearhead meeting with TAC and if you need help connecting with the right person to do that with, you could reach out to Stephanie and me and we can connect you. Um, and potentially I think something we could do in the shorter term was, is Steve's, Steve's idea around um, having a, sort of educating ourselves on the roadmap and some of the sort of getting priming the pump in terms of what we need to do for climate um, and either having that communi communication directly with residents or potentially also with a group of local climate activists that are going out there and, and you know, make get, getting their message out there. I think also an easy short-term thing we can do is that if ever we are involved in an outreach event, um, you know, we're sort of making sure these messages of our of the Amherst climate goals are getting getting included. Um, and so that could be Vasu with you, you know, an alumni event with UMass or Andra with any events that your group is hosting. Um, so that seems like some short-term things we could do. A little bit longer term, I think, would be like maybe the four. I really like the idea of the for, forum with the commercial heating providers, forum with commercial truck, like group, you know, organ or businesses in town that have a lot of truck fleet, like have fleets of trucks. I think could be another interesting forum to have. Um, I think as we talked about last week, you know, we may not be exactly the right people to run those forums. Um, it would require pay probably some education on our own part or bringing in partners. And it sounds like to do either of those things, maybe a first step would be to connect with the bid. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to take a lead on sort of connecting with the bid and explaining some of our ideas of bringing together different groups of commercial folks and seeing if they have thoughts on how to do that, if they have connections with these, those types of groups or not. All right, I don't see any immediate take or I'm Don's. happy to try. Yeah, I'm happy to okay. try, at least Great. reach out preliminarily. Yeah. Great. Um, and then in terms of these kind of, there's there were sort of two main buckets of kind of ongoing work. Um, 
one being the rental housing project that Steve Steve mentioned. And then I thought we we added some interesting, we had some interesting discussion of add-ons to that. Like maybe we need to be adding on charging stations and biking infrastructure and you know for new builds like placement with transit um and then renewables so there is sort of like a we're starting with efficiency but there may be opportunities to expand to other other issues um, and we're starting with data collection um but we can you know learn from that as well as from the program with the family outreach of amherst um and then once we've sort of learned a little bit from both of those efforts um you know figure out whether we want to bring people together um you know do a and, and what the and what the town council's doing to steve's point if they're already bringing people together then maybe we don't need to bring people together or maybe we bring people together um just on c c pace or something um so it sounds like immediate next steps with that is just to continue to get updates from Steve on the data collection and Steve and Lori um, as Lori's expressed interest on the data collection process um, and Stephanie on the program with uh, family outreach and then we kind of reassess in a few months what our next steps were are based on both of the progress on both of those places and then the solar project is the other big one right I think Dwayne you mentioned um, a lot of you made a lot of good points around things that gaps that ECAC may need to fill and we sort of have to wait and see what the scope of the consultant work and the working group is going to end up being to figure out what gaps we do need to fill although I do think we could potentially start having discussions and maybe we could put this as an agenda item for next time um and I know Steve you circulated something to this point but we maybe we should start having our own discussions about what we think the scenarios should be and how we might want to acclimate those ideas with folks in town and that could even feed into this potential forum we have with climate act with like some of the climate activists um uh to sort of like i mean i think in my mind an ideal situation is that is that you know ecac mothers out front Sunrise, all these groups are really recognizing we may have some slight differences, but we all agree that like these three scenarios are going to give us some answers that we need to be able to figure out what our path forward is for solar in Amherst. Um, did I miss anything? So up, so just to recap, some short-term programming ideas and meetings. Um, some longer term ideas for which Dawn is gonna reach out to bid and, and start maybe seeing if that's an avenue to take. And then these two kind of big projects related to rental housing and, and the solar. I'm not sure which bucket the um, homeowners outreach fits into. It's not just um, education, it, it's also, you know, actually helping people to make home conversions yeah so we should okay so i was i was fitting that in both under the sort of forum with the commercial heating and sort of under the kind of learning that we're going to get from stephanie the project stephanie described because that does sound like it's a it's a type of coaching if i understand that stephanie Sorry, it's not so much um, a coaching as um, gathering information. I, the they're they're being called sort of coaches, but they're basically just the people that are <clears throat> going to serve as a lead to gather the survey information from people in their building complexes. Okay, so yeah, so Andre, maybe to back to you then. What what do you? Th I mean, we're not going to be the ones doing the thing. So like putting in the heat pumps <laughs> but so do you have a um beyond working with the community i guess I'm, I'm wondering what the like action item would be there or Lori, you have well I mean, Andre, Andre should answer if she uh, yeah I, I, Lori might be thinking the same thing it's you know we're, we're learning about um block power and other um companies that do this for municipalities and 
we should be looking into it. Right. Yeah. I was going to point out that's the thing we've left out of all of this is I think as part of the work to try to figure out how to convent, convert rental units, for example, it's fine to learn about what Massachusetts offers and reaching out to people and getting them involved in an early stage so they don't feel like they're being blindsided. But I think what we really need to be doing is bringing in some sort of a consulting group to or to actually do the transition to, to tell people, OK, you know, go into the building. Here's what we can do. And that has to be set up so that it's easy for people to do, right? It has to be, we have to be that matchmaker, I think, that finds the service that's going to actually make this happen. That's sort of how I see us, because we can do all the research in the world and figure out, you know, where everybody is. But if we don't take that next step, we're not going to get anything done. And, and we can't do it. And hooking people up one at a time with contractors is also a non-winning situation. It's, it's too... Uh, it's too time intensive for everybody and we're not equipped to do that correctly, right? But there are companies that are, and I think it's not just block power. I think there are others out there too. I've been trying to figure this out. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, maybe I'll put that on a, as another sort of ongoing place for research and I'll put Lori and Andra down as potential researchers there um, because that feels like a place where yeah, like I really enjoyed the Block Power presentation and what they could provide. And my immediate, then my, I think I immediately went to how would we actually actualize that in Amherst? Mm -hmm. And then I stopped yeah. and thinking of a good idea. Can I ask a question of Stephanie? So, to the extent that what we're doing is research, trying to figure things out, trying to work through documents together to understand them. Uh, is that stuff we can do outside of an open meeting as a, you know, a few of us getting together and talking over the Massachusetts uh, 2050 plan, for example? Like I said, if one of two, if one of you is sort of like the point person okay, and they want to say, um, do you have feedback on this? But when you start gathering a few of you, like three of you, and you have a meeting all together, it's one thing if Steve wanted to go to you, talk with you, or then Steve meets with you, with Andra, talks to Andra. But if the three of you get together to have this big in conversation about working through something, um, that you're kind of developing a plan that sort of serves the work that you do that you've been charged with. Just to do yeah. the research, not to develop a plan, but just to understand something like like this 2050 Massachusetts plan. Right. So again, you know, they're fuzzy lines. I just, you know, you have to be careful because you can't even have the sort of perception of somehow colluding, you know. Uh -huh. So it's it is, I mean, I know it's it's challenging. Everybody gets irritated with open meeting law, but at the same time, it's to keep transparency so people know what the town's doing. So Again, you know, if there's a way that you can do it through, um, you know, Steve could maybe have some information and share it and say, what do you think about this, you know, to both of you, and then you both could respond to Steve, but you're not necessarily all three having a dialogue about it. That's, that's a way that you can do that. And that's totally acceptable. The only other thing I would ask is we don't forget to discuss, we need to figure out whether or not we're having a meeting next week or not. That's important. <laughs> okay, so in terms, of, um, in terms of structure of our meeting, so the way they've been going recently is we've done ECAC member updates, which sort of turn into updates on, you know, Steve usually will give an update on the, re on the residential uh, or the rental, housing electrification project, for example. So it kind of morphs into, and, and I think as we're moving forward, I think Steve, you know, as you have a more defined role working with Mandy Joe, and you would want to bring stuff back to ECAC and Dwayne as you as well, you know, you're going to be on these teams and bringing things back to ECAC. It may make sense to move some of the project-based work so I guess, so I, I can see it two, going one or two, one of two ways. One is we just sort of, our agenda is ECAC member updates and anything else topical. And we spend the ECAC member updates having each of us give an update on the things we're working on. That's probably the easiest way to do it. The other way to do it would be to have sort of standing agenda items on each of these kind of buckets of items, short-term outreach, longer, or outreach maybe, including short and long-term, and then these 
three buckets of projects, rental housing, solar project and residential heating to start. Does anybody have any like strong feelings either way? I think it makes sense to, to organize it by our projects. So there's sort of more focus and, and opportunity and, and to some extent responsibility for each of us to, to um, you know, make some progress and present it. Um, uh, uh, um, what I'm struggling with is that um, this, is, this is also the only time that we can work together uh, because otherwise it's very cumbersome uh, to, to create a whole nother meeting uh, uh, on the books or whatever for three of us to get together uh, to, to actually work together on a topic. Uh, so I do wonder whether there's structure to be had in the meeting. Um, you know, ideally, you get, you know, what Lori was saying, you get together and you spend an hour, an hour and a half together. And we don't have that sort of time in, in these, in these uh, you know, in, in our ECAC meetings. But is there some structure in these meetings where some actual collaboration, collaborative work can get done? Uh, because the, in, in, in nuggets, at least. Um, to move things forward, um, because otherwise it's really hard to um, uh, work. You know, I, I think it, I think what we're identifying here is there's a lead, and the lead's kind of responsible for moving things forward week by week. But I think we really want to work together uh, on on some of these areas. And so, is there room in the agenda? in a condensed way to, you know, carve out for each topic, here's an update and here's, you know, here's 10 minutes to, 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 to do something collaboratively to, to uh, discuss or, or reach some decisions. Yeah, so that's a good point too, Dwayne. So instead of making every meeting be an update on everything, maybe it's, we folks need to be, I guess we could, this would require more, upfront planning from you all, but like, you know, making sure that we have an agenda, you know, and maybe we do it, we, we, we're sometimes good and sometimes not good at planning the agenda for the next meeting during the meeting. Um, but like, it would be great if we knew, okay, this next meeting, Dwayne's gonna take a deep dive on the solar stuff for us. So um, we have that planned ahead. And then if, if you wanna get on the queue, you get on the queue for the next meeting. Um, yeah, Steve. Yeah, I, I like that. I think it might be nice though to have at least brief reports from all of the projects, but then plan to have one or two projects go into those deeper dives. Okay. Like just, just each, each project gives a brief update and then hopefully one or two has a, leads a discussion or asks questions that they'd like feedback from other members or, or gets into the nitty gritty. Um, so I, I think I also, I, yeah. Okay. I also want us um, to, to not feel it's not that cumbersome to have, you know, a public meeting. You, you just have to have it posted. That's all. Um, you plan a time, you post, you know, Stephanie will post it. And, um, and then, you know, you can have attendees and they can ask questions. And, you know, we have nothing to hide. So, so um, I, I encourage groups of three to join together, ask Stephanie to post a meeting and, and just do it. I'll remind you that right now there's Zoom meetings, so they all have to be coordinated and I'd have to um, host them all right now. I need to, because the, the town has to host them. You can't host your own meeting. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And it, remind me how long in advance you have to post it? 48 hours. Oh, okay. So it's not impossible, yeah. but mm -hmm. we do, but we do have to get in into the clerk's office a little bit in advance of that. So I'd want it, you know, if you were going to plan a meeting and you wanted to post it publicly, I'd want to have at least a, like a four day lead time minimum, really because we'd need to post the agenda and post it publicly and post it on the ECAC page. And you, I think the thing is, you know, again, you can have conversations with one another. It's not like you can't, you know, if you're trying to get like, if say Steve is the lead and he wants to get, 
you know, Andra, what do you think about this? And get your input. You can do that. You know, he can get input from you. And that's fine. Okay, so it sounds like it's not impossible, but there are some hoops to jump through. And so I think the other thing we should probably bring into our meetings is if we're starting to have a discussion and we feel like it would be better suited to have a two person discussion to bring back to the group or a larger meeting, then we should be bringing those up as options to make sure we, to the extent that they're helping to move our work forward. Um, okay, we have two minutes left. So let's talk about, oh yeah, Steve, quick. Well, I, I just wanted to talk about the next meeting and um, note that Dwayne and I prepared uh, sort of some discussion points for ECAC to provide recommendations on the kinds of questions, some of the questions that the town funded solar assessment might study. And I would love to meet next week to have that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'm on this, I'm, um, I kind of agree just in the sense that we have these meetings already in our calendars for every two weeks. And so to then change them to be the every other two weeks might be. <laughs> so we may want to power through with one more meeting next week and then get back on our regular schedule. And if somebody can't make it, you know, it's recorded and we can go back to it. Does that, is it, is there anybody, but we need a quorum. So just, is there anybody that definitely can't make it next weekend, next week? Okay, not seeing anything. So let us know if you if something comes up, but otherwise let's plan on meeting next week. And I think, yes, yeah, Steve, um, sort of doing doing a we're, having that be our main agenda item sounds like a good good plan. Anything, any other agenda item? Other, so so we can continue to do our ECAC member updates, which is where, you know, Don, if you for example had a chance to reach out to the bid, you could give an update there, and then um, go from there into a deep dive on the solar stuff. Is there anything else people want, someone wants to add to the agenda before we close? Um, it looks like TAC is having a meeting on Tuesday. Um, it's a little hard to tell because it says the next meeting is Thursday, May 17th, 2022. But I think the 17th is a Tuesday, right? Yeah, they normally do meet on Thursdays. Um, so maybe they did a, who's the, okay. who the chair is? It doesn't say, but I was gonna say, I could go and just kind of raise this question of what they're taking on and what what it might make sense for ECAC to take on and, and kind of just chat about that, but, um, and then report back. But if it's on Thursday, if it's actually Thursday, wait for me. If it's Thursday the 19th, then maybe that's something for the next meeting. Okay. You say it's normally Thursday? It is normally Thursday, yeah. Okay, then let, I'll assume it's the 19th. Okay. You might wanna double check. Um, okay. Because I, sometimes they do, depending on if they, for some reason, people couldn't meet and so they decide to meet on the Tuesday. So I wouldn't assume that the posting is wrong. Okay. Um, so you might want to reach out if there's a staff liaison, you might want to reach out to the staff liaison. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, and probably reach out anyway, just to get, they may not have room on their next agenda. So it may yeah. be a couple of weeks before you can get on the agenda. Um, great. Well, thanks all. This is a really productive conversation. I think we have a good path forward and some great ideas on the books here. Um, so yeah, we'll leave it there. All right, thanks everybody. Thank Bye you. all. Thank you very much.